Hello, spooky friends. It's me, DJ, your host of Crips and Corks. I'm not here with Paul because this isn't an episode. We just wanted to give you a heads up that we're going to do our first ever live streamed episode on February the 10th at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Instagram and Facebook. We're going to be doing this in honor of Valentine's Day. I mean, Singles Awareness Day. Paul and I are both going to die alone, never having gone married. So in honor of all of our singles and our would-be singles, if they weren't happily in relationships who would like to join us on that night, we're going to do a special Valentine's Day story, have Valentine's Day cocktails, and follow it up with a little question answer session with anyone who'd be there. So please join us on Instagram or Facebook Live on February 10th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And until then, keep your crypts tight and your corks loose. Bye! Somebody burnt down my she shed. Nobody burnt down your she shed, Carol. It was struck by lightning. Is my she shed covered by State Farm? Ooh, I'm gonna get a new she share she shed. She share. And welcome back to Crips and Corpse, episode 18. I'm your host, DJ, here with my co host, Paul, as usual. Paul, how was your week? You know, it was fine, but we could skip right ahead to the business because we have some business to address today. I am going to start a little good old segment, the hot guy of the month. Oh, Jesus, the m- not the white boy of the month. I didn't say white. Doesn't have to be white. It could be any person of any race. It's just some hot guy of the month that I'm obsessed with. And this week, this month, I should say, not week... We are obsessed with Charlie Puth. And Lord knows, that's Lord with an E. Lord knows, Adele knows, Beyonce knows, I know, we all know. That I am a Charlie Puth apologist. Yes, we know that. And for some reason, I think that this whole flavor of the month scheme you've got going on is going to just turn into Baskin Robbins and be 21 different flavors of... (laughs) I I don't even know what, but it's going to be 21 different flavors. I do move on from these men pretty quickly. I'm not going to lie. Because like last Last week. Last week it was, it was the emo boys. Yeah. Yeah. But it it was was Maniskin. Mainskin. Yeah. I think it's Mainskin. I forget how to pronounce it. It's Italian, I think. It's not Italian. He is like Scandinavian. No, he's Italian. He lives in Italy. He was born. Listen, I looked up. But that word. Look it up. That word is not Italian. Google I took it. Italian. I am Googling it. Because I watched five of his interviews, okay? And I'm just about to be focusing on my good old homeboy, Charlie Puth, right now. But we. Also, first of all, his name is Damiano. Yeah, Damiano David. But the band's name is Monoskin. Okay, I never knew that that, um, I thought that was like a Scandinavian, that little circle over the A. It's fine, you know, we all make mistakes. But you know who doesn't make mistakes? Charlie Puth. In his 2022 album, Charlie. No skips on that album, oh my god. And then his most recent song. It is a Danish word. Oh, it is Danish? Yeah, it's Danish for moonlight. I don't know much about geography, but I don't think Danish and Scandinavian are the same thing. Denmark's in Scandinavia. Is it really? Yes. What? Okay, I'm gonna have to Google this later. We can talk about it. I am gonna do a whole episode on Scandinavia. All right. Well, we talked about Vikings Paul. <laughs> Listen, I don't. I don't remember. I remember the important things. I know you don't. You don't know geology. We all know exactly. In my brain, is nothing but Charlie Puth right now. His new song, Lipstick. Oh my gosh, iconic. It's not that new. I mean, it's, it's not. It's that recent, new. but yeah, I mean, I think that's what turns you into a Charlie Puth apologist. A little bit. One thing I will not apologize for, for him though, is how he refers to women as the B word in that song. We do not stand that. I do not support that. And I know there's like rumors and things of him like gay baiting and things like that. I mean, it's working obviously because like, here I am obsessed with this straight man. But I'll leave y'all alone about Charlie Puth for right now. Just know he's hot. There's more to come. And he is the hot man of February. 
How about your week, DJ? <laughs> um, it was fine. There's, um, it was fine. I mean, yeah, it was fine. Work was a lot per usual. Right. What can you do? It, it's the busy time of year. It's just a lot. And like, we've got this new phone policy that's just doesn't, personally to me, it doesn't make sense. And so trying to like wrap my head around something that just doesn't fit into the logic. But I'm going to go on a little rant here based off something my grandmother said to me this morning before I left the house. Oh, I'm ready. Let's go. This is a Come As You Are podcast. On this podcast, we do not believe that clothes have a gender. Clothes do not have a weight. Anyone can wear makeup. Anyone can wear skincare. Yes. Anyone can love who they want to love. Anyone can identify in a way that is true to themselves because I have this like knockoff Louis Vuitton bag Mm -hmm. and I love it. And I, the whole reason why I got it was like to have like a chicer way to carry like all of my stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's my aunt's birthday and we're going out for dinner tonight after this. And my grandmother looks at the bag and she goes, please don't take that big ugly purse. Oh, with you tonight. <laughs> and the whole and here's the thing: the reason why she called it a big ugly purse was not because she thinks it's a big ugly purse. It's because that her, her grandson is carrying carrying purse. it. Yeah, and it's like, and I just want to say, clothes have no gender, makeup has no gender, clothes have no weight. We are a come as you are podcast. We love you regardless, and don't be a dick. Or you get the stick. Exactly. Wear what you want to wear. Whatever makes you feel good. Whatever makes you feel pretty. Whatever makes you feel handsome, if you like. Whatever term. And if my wants. grandmother wasn't going to be 85 in May, she would get the stick for that comment. Right, right. But she's 85. And I, there is no elder abuse in this household. And with that, Paul, are you ready to drink? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. Um, You really admired the name of this one. Yeah, it looks so cool. I love the bottle. Yes. We have a Vine in Flames Pinot Gris from Budaresca. Ooh, love a good Pinot Gris. Um, It is a dry wine. Sorry, Paul. Um, It is a vintage 2019. The legend says that as the popularity of the excellent Dacian wine spread, the Dacian king, Burabista, feared that his territories would be in danger of a foreign attack. To put a stop to this, he burned the vineyards so no foreign invader could benefit from them. Centuries later, we can all benefit once again from the vines of this area, regrown from the ashes of Dacian vineyards and producing enviable high-quality wines. Greenish yellow in color with ripe pear aromas combined with very fresh and clean acidity. This is a well-structured wine with a pleasant taste of juicy pears, which reveals a mineral hint in the aftertaste. And this is a pu- a product of Villa Budaresca in Romania. Romania. Okay. Ooh. That was a good pop. Yeah, I like that pop. That was a good one. Ooh, she's a dry. Ooh. Let me give her a good old Yeah, whisk. I sniff the corf. Like, I'm such a sommelier. Ooh. That is going to be dry, girl. I'm ready. Okay. Maybe I'll get used. Ooh, sorry. ASMR pour. Maybe I'll get used to drier wines, though. I wanted to pour mine first because Paul put ice in his, and I didn't know if that would ruin the ASMR pour. Either way. It's not dry in a bad way. No, I like that. That's so it's clean. good. It's clean. It is clean. It do- I know exactly what you mean mm-hmm. when you say it tastes clean. It tastes... Yeah, it's nice and refreshing. I like that a lot. Wow. Yeah, when it said dry, I was like, mmm... Yeah, that's nice. Ooh, that, ooh that's okay. a good summer wine. Also, real quick before you get started, whenever you say um, about me not liking dry wines, I think of that salt burn quote now where she's like, I don't like women. They're just so wet. No, if you're going to quote it, quote it right. I was a lesbian once, but in the end it was all too wet for me. Men are also wonderfully dry. 
Exactly. You did that a lot better than I could. Um, Mike was texting me this morning, our good friend Mike. He finally watched Saltburn with his boyfriend Riley last night. Oh, girl. He had some hot takes, which so did I. Um, (laughs) I said, I said, let me see. If, I mean, this is February. If you haven't seen it yet, like, your fault. Spoilers. Skip ahead a minute. Right. Um, what came first? It was the bathtub and then the vampire scene. Yeah, yeah. And I said, like, I said the bathtub scenes, like, set my back up. But after the vampire scene, everything that happened, like, the grave scene, um, him killing the mom, it was just like, huh, okay. Right, right. The vampire scene was crazy. Like, but I'm a vampire. That scene was probably the wildest scene. Well, Paul, with that, let me tell you a story. You're traveling for business. It is late, and you're traveling in a strange com- country where superstitions reign over modern science and logic. You remember again the look of fear in the peasant's eyes when you said where it was you were going as they crossed themselves and made gestures to ward off evil. You shiver as you hear the wolves howl again outside and wonder how far you are from your destination. You look out the window and see it, a huge foreboding castle whose battlements and parapets rise out of the rock on which it stands into the night sky like an angry hand pointing and mocking God himself. You are dropped at the entrance by your guide, who flees off into the night and leaves you alone. The door opens, and you are greeted by an old man, an ancient man, who is aristocratic and bearing, and whose speech is archaic, yet charming. Be not venit. Welcome to my house. Enter freely of your own will. Come freely. Go safely. And leave something of the happiness you bring. Mind not the wolves, the children of the night, what music they make. You enter the castle and ask the man if he is the one you have traveled to see. He smiles, revealing very white, very sharp teeth. Yeah, yes, I am Dracula. Today we are discussing Bran Castle and the real Dracula. Iconic! I love Dracula and vampires. I'm so excited. I didn't even mean to bring up Saltburn in the I'm a vampire scene. <laughs> but then I was like, now that we did, I have to like get in there now and do yes. the story. Like this can no, this tangent can't go any further because this is perfect. It's like we planned it. And now the Romanian wine makes sense. Yes. But very nice. You probably very thought nice. I was gonna do like a house fire or something with the flames. Yeah, I really wasn't sure. But... No, I like went out of my way to like, totally out of my way to get this wine because only one wine and spirits in Pittsburgh had this Romanian wine. That's crazy. Only one has it. Because that's a good wine. I know. They had 14... Now they have 13 bottles in stock. I think I'm going to go and buy the rest of them. Jeez. I wouldn't blame you, honestly. Get ready for the summer. Because this is definitely a summer wine, girl. Oh. And I'm ready for the summer. And I'm ready to hear more about dry... Wait, what was... Oh, you're going to give yeah. us his name. <laughs> yes. So... I'm going to show you a picture. This is Bran Castle, which is foreignly known as Dracula's Castle. It's so spooky and beautiful. Okay, me and, me and my grandmother did pick this one out together because I was having trouble finding pictures because all of them are so beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I was like, okay, Nanny, this is Dracula's Castle. Help me pick a picture. And she's like, that one is spooky. And I was like, yeah, that's very spooky. Right. It's so beautiful in the spookiest way. And I love it. All right. Buckle up, Paul, and put your thinking hat on because I've got some history for you. Ooh, girl, let's go. Um, so it is a castle located just outside of the town of Bran in the Transylvania region of Romania. And it is located on the Transylvanian side of the historic border with Wallachia. Okay. Which is another part of the region. Okay. So okay. these used to, so like, Romania has Transylvania now. And historically, it was this idea of greater Romania because it was many Romanians lived there and they only got it in 1920. But it used to be a bunch of little principalities Mm -hmm. that were looked over by a prince who were fiefs of a king, either the Hungarian, the Moldovian, or the Romanian, depending on who had the most power at the time. 
Okay. Um, the first structure built here was a wooden fortress called Dietrichstein by the Teutonic Order, which was the Catholic military order, from the Crusades, oh. like the Templars. And it was built in 1212. So it wasn't always a castle. It started out as a wooden structure. Yes, it was a wooden fortress Mm -hmm. built on the top of a rocky crag at the start of Brand Pass, which is a pass to the Carpathian Mountains. Mm -hmm. Um, Transylvania is, like, surrounded all by mountains. And it's beautiful. Like, it's... Like, everyone's like, oh, Transylvania, it's so spooky. But, like, doing all my research, it's so beautiful. Right. Sometimes you just gotta embrace the spook. I mean, like, it is spooky. We'll get into that later. But, like, it's just so beautiful. Like, it's... Like, they don't have highways yet. So everything's like these, like... It's just pretty. Mm -hmm. The name Dietrichstein translates roughly to Dietrich Stone, and it is believed to have been built by a commander of the Teutorna... Teutonic order named Dietrich. However, in 1942, so only 30 years after this wooden fortress was built, the Mongols came to the area and burnt it to the ground. Oh, you said 1932? 1242. 1242. 1242. Okay. I thought there was something little off there. I was like, uh, yeah, when I'm like, only 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> 1212 and 1942 were only 12 years, Paul. I don't know what you're talking right. about. I don't know how I heard 1932. I was like, oh, that's You probably cool. did. I probably misspoke. <laughs> um, the current stone castle was built around 1377. King Louis I of Hungary granted the right to the Saxons of Konstadt to build a stone castle at the location. Mm-hmm. Saxons are Germans. Oh, They're German okay. people. Okay. And Konstadt is the closest city. It is now called Brashov. Okay. Um, once the castle was built, the settlement of Braun developed nearby, around the foot of the castle. Unlike many castles, it was not the home of a noble family, but a fortification to protect the German residents of the area. It was especially used as a defensive force against the Ottoman Turks, who had a habit of invading the area. Spooky. Because, like, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire was, like, just to the south. Mm -hmm. And so you have, like, Eastern European, and then you have the Muslim. So you have Eastern European, Orthodox, Catholic, Catholic, um, Christianity, and then you have Ottoman Islam. Mm -hmm. Um, And if history tells us anything, those two don't really go. Yeah, they butt heads. Yeah, so I mean, the thing that's separating them is like a couple mountain passes. (laughs) Not much. In the early 1400s, the castle was held by the Vovod of Wallachia, Mercia the Elder. And Mycera the Elder turned it into a customs post. So remember, it's on that border between Transylvania and Wallachia, mm-hmm. right by this pass. So merchants would come through. So as the Wallachian merchants would come into Transylvania, they would have to go through customs at Brand Castle. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. So like when you go to Ca- when you went to Canada earlier this year, and you had to go through like the border. Right. Right. There were border patrols. Yeah. At some point in the early 1500s, the kings of Hungary did con- take control of the castle. Um, but it was lost when King Vladislaus II failed to pay loans to the city of Brasov, and they repossessed in 1533. Dang! <laughs> so just because you're king does not mean you don't get repossessed on. Right? I didn't know they were rep- sorry repossessing shit back then. Like, I thought that was just, like, a modern thing. Well, no, because he, like, took it, like... He leased it, mm-hmm. and he wasn't, like, making payments. Damn. They had bitches leasing castles back in the day. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I mean, these this is, like, a German settlement mm-hmm. in the area. I don't know. Just, like, the fact they had, like, finance back in the day like that. Like, they had loans and leasing and things. I thought that was, like... Well, I mean, when I say lease, I mean, he was, like, okay, like... Because what I got was the King of Hungary was kind of, like... The head king of the area, mm-hmm. the Transylvanian prince, the Wallachian prince, they all kind of were his fiefs, mm-hmm. which means like they ruled over their land, but he ruled over them. Okay. So basically he was like, oh, let me lease this for like, let me le- lease this and use it as a fortress for a war. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so the locals were like, okay, because they did own it. Like, they were given the land of the castle by King Louis I. And then when he wasn't making payments, they were like, okay, like... We're taking it back. We're taking it back. Makes sense, makes sense. Brain Castle continued to play a key strategic role into the 18th century. Actually, I saw... I think I read on their website the last, like, big military, like... Like, the last time it was used militarily was, like, in 1818. Okay. That so that's, like, 600 years of military use. That's a lot. I'm surprised, like, it's like didn't get damaged terribly or something like that being used for military stuff that long. Yeah. Well, maybe it did, and they just rebuilt it. Who knows? I mean, you probably know, but whatever. So, in 1920, the city of Brasov unanimously voted to give the castle to the Queen of Mar- of Romania... Maria of Edinburgh, whom they described, and this is a quote from the deed, the great queen who spreads her blessing everywhere she walked, thus winning with an irresistible momentum the hearts of the entire country's population. Fun. Cute. I too spread my blessings on places. You sowing your wild oats is not the same as the blessing she spread, and let me tell you why. Queen Marie was born Princess Marie of Edinburgh, and she was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Oh, she's the Russian bitch, isn't she? Victoria. No, I'm thinking of Anastasia. You're thinking of Anastasia, who was Queen Victoria's great-granddaughter. Wait, so Victoria is Russian? Victoria was British. Oh. But she married her children or grandchildren off to all the... Oh. Wow. The more you know, kids. The more you know. Um, And she married Crown Prince, later King Ferdinand of Romania. Um, Despite being foreign born, she loved her adopted country wholeheartedly and was deeply loved in return by the Romanian people. Oh, so she was like their Princess Diana. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Um... During the Paris Peace Conference, which was to conclude the First World War, Marie was sent to lead the Romanian delegation and to lobby for Romania's interests, especially in retaking the region of Transylvania, after Prime Minister Bratineau fell out with the United States, the UK, France, and Italy. So basically, so Romania was on the Allied side, and they really stood up against the Central Powers. Mm Mm-hmm. But there is one there is one point in the war where the Romanian government and not the king tried to make peace with Germany. Mm-hmm. And the king said no. And so the big four were like, well, yeah, the king said no, but the government wanted to. So maybe we won't give them Transylvania. And so the prime minister was like, yeah, and he left. Okay. And so they sent Queen Marie. And there's this wonderful story. She met the French Prime Minister Clemenceau. And the first thing he said to her was, Madame, I do not like your Prime Minister. And she smiled at him and she said, Hopefully you will like me better. Oh my gosh. And he did because due to her boldness and charm, um, actually, during the peace conference, she would wave her ministers away and say, no, no, I'm going to negotiate this. Oh, bad bitch energy. She was able to achieve very favorable terms for Romania, including reuniting with Transylvania. Oh, that's nice. Good for her. Yeah, so it was because pretty much because of her that Romania and Transylvania were finally reunited. Oh, that's so nice. Upon receiving the castle, she set about restoring and modernizing it. She had an English garden with two ponds and a tea house, all of which still stands today. Okay, that's something I would do. Honestly, that's me coded because I love a good pond and I love a good greenhouse. I've always wanted a koi tea pond. House. Oh, tea house. Never mind. But the koi yeah, pond, yeah. yes. Yes, yeah. koi pond. Um, she converted the old well into an elevator for ease of getting from the bottom of the crag to the castle because she started to develop arthritis in her old age. And she had water, electric, and plumbing plants built for the castle, but she also had them hooked up to all the local villages. So the local villages got plumbing, water, and electricity for the first time thanks to her. So she did a lot. She did a lot. Good for her. 
1927, her husband, King Ferdinand, died, and her grandson became King Michael I after her son, Carol, had given up his right to the throne to run away with his mistress. <laughs> tea. Okay, that's this, more me. This is it. tea. Like her son, dead ass said, I don't want no stinking ass Romania if I can have my my mistress. And so he divorced, so he left, he divorced his wife, and, like, when he left, he was like, I don't want the throne. Girl, that's crazy. Didn't, like, Prince Harry do the same thing with his, uh, whatever she's called, his wife? We're not gonna get into him. Okay, yeah, we gotta focus on Dracula. We gotta focus on We gotta get through this history, let's go, let's keep going. Queen Marie was very apprehensive about her grandson, who was six when his grandfather died and he became king, being king. Um, because he could not personally reign at that point, the country would be run by governors until he turned 18. And she always hoped that her son Carol would come back, and so she kind of refused to take part, helping her grandson be king. Mm-hmm. And it kind of paid off because in 1930, Carol got tired of his mistress, came back to Romania, and stole the throne from his son. Oh. T. That is tea. Okay, and this was, this was so funny because I, I had to read this three times. He came back to Romania. He had to get his son's permission to come back into Romania. <laughs> so he gets back. He First place he goes is the Romanian parliament. He goes, I'm ready to be king now. And the Romanian parliament was like, long live King Carol II. Jeez, they accepted him back so quick. Like that. Like he literally left, said, fuck you. I want to be with my mistress. And then he was like... I'm tired of gambling in Monte Carlo and having sex with my mistress. I would like to be king now. Oh my, that's wild. However, relations remained strained between Marie and her son. They had always had a very contentious relationship, mostly because um, her husband's predecessor, who was, I think was an uncle or a grandfather, he wasn't a father, took the son off of them and said, I'm going to raise him as my heir. And so Marie and her husband were much different than her son was because of his surrogate father. And Marie really helped Ferdinand during his rule as king. And so she tried to help Carol and he said, nah, mom, fuck you. I got this. He did not get have it. And it was during this time that Nazi and fascist sympathizers formed a group called the Iron Guard. And this is at the rise of Nazi Germany and the fascists are already have power in Italy. So this is all like the lead up to World War II. Mm-hmm. And Carol was like, ah, oh, shit, this Hitler's going to like wipe my wipe the floor with my ass. Mm hmm. And so at the end in 1933, during the annual Independence Day parade, Carol sent his mother to the parade in his stead, hoping that the Nazi and fascist sympathizers would shoot her instead of him. Oh. Because there were fears of a plotted assassination, he said, well, I'll send my mother who I don't like. Hopefully they take her out. And then I don't have to deal with her. Dang. He really threw his own mom. <laughs> yeah. Like, under the bus. That's crazy. Following that, she did retire from public life, um, and she spent more and more of her time at Bran Castle, which she had lovingly restored. Um, She died in 1937, and in 1940, her heart was interred in a specially built chapel at Bran Castle by her daughter, Princess Eliana, to whom she had left it. During World War II, Eliana operated the Hospital of the Queen's Heart at the castle. Oh, that's cute. However, in 1948, there was a communist revolution, and Eliana and her family were forced out of Brink Castle and had to flee Romania, at which point the communist government looted the castle and turned it into a museum. In 1991, Eliana, who was now a mother abbess of a convent who took the name Mother Alexandra, was allowed by the Romanian government, who had overthrown communism, to visit Brain Castle and to see how it had been converted into a museum and how the post-communism renovations were going. Well, at least they turned it into a museum and not, like, tore it down or something. She died shortly after this visit and was buried in Elwood City, 40 minutes north of here. Oh, really? That's crazy. With a box of soil from the castle with her. Ooh, already getting into the vampire lore. In 2006, the Romanian government returned ownership of the castle to 
uh, Princess Eleanor's son, Archduke Dominic of Austria and his siblings. He's also a grandson of Queen Marie. And they continue to run the castle today as Romania's first private museum. Here's a picture of the castle at all times, and you can really see how it's on this top of this rocky crag. Yeah. And then here's from like a more downward angle. And then that's a picture of Queen Marie. Cute. And a painting. And like I said, her heart, just her heart was buried at Brain Castle. That is the outer box. Oh, it's really pretty. Mm hmm. So inside that, there's like a silver receptacle, and her heart is wrapped in the Romanian and the British flags. Mm hmm. And then that's the chapel where it's buried. Oh, nice. All right, Paul. You're probably thinking, that's great. I very much am, and I'm ready to hear the spooky shit. And you're probably thinking, where the fuck is Dracula? I know, like, what's going on, sister? What's the tea? Dracula, which is how you say it in Romanian. Mm -hmm. And so, because we're talking about a Romanian person, I will be saying it in Romanian. Do not make fun of me. Oh, don't worry. I will. (laughs) (laughs) Um... So Dracula was really Vlad III, who was Voivode of Wallachia. Mm-hmm. Dracula was the second legitimate son of Vlad II Dracul, who is Voivode of Wallachia, who, and Dracul was an illegitimate son of Maestrea II the Elder. Remember, he was the one who turned Bran Castle into a customs house. Okay, okay. Party. The name Thakul is an honorific, which means he got it from his membership in the Order of the Dragon. Thakul means the dragon. So his son, in honor of his father, adopted the name Thakula, which means son of the dragon. That's badass. Dang, my name's so boring compared to that. Thakul usurped the throne from his half-brother Alexander in 1436. During his time as Voivode, he fought against invasions from the Ottoman Empire. During the war, his son Dracula and his brother Rudu were held hostage by the Ottomans to secure their father's loyalty. And Dracul actually wrote letters saying that his sons would be slaughtered and butchered in the name of Christianity. Because he just kind of left them. Damn. <laughs> and continued fighting the war. Eventually, though, he worked out an agreement with the Ottomans whereby he would pay a yearly tribute of gold and money and treasure to the sultan of the ottoman empire in exchange for them not invading okay okay however in 1447 the regent of hungary invaded wallachia and killed dracul and his elder son maestrea vlad or dracula and his brother rudu fled back to the ottoman empire for safety in 1448 dracula led an Ottoman army and usurped the throne from his cousin, Vladislav II, while he's, whilst he was away on a military campaign against the Ottomans, but was deposed in December of the same year when Vladislav returned. Dang. The rule didn't last long. Nope. Vlad then spent time in Moldova, where his maternal uncle was king, although he did try to settle in Brasov before being exiled back to Moldova by the Hungarians. And remember, Brashov is the area of Bren Castle. In spring of 1456, Vlad Dracula took the Wallachian throne with Hungarian support. Among his first acts was to execute anyone who had participated in the murder of his father and brother and anyone who he thought might oppose him. His preferred method of execution was to impale them on large wooden stakes. And there we get the nickname. This led to his name, (laughs) his nickname, Vlad Tepish, which is Romanian for Vlad the Impaler. Sorry, I didn't mean to take your thunder there. It's I've okay. seen a documentary about this, so I kind of know a little bit. Rumors abounded that there were so many victims on stakes outside of Vlad's residence that it looked like a forest. Of just dead heads on stakes. Of bodies. Oh, full bodies. Okay. Because what he would do is they'd have this sharpened spike. And they'd set you on it, like, sort of in your hoo-ha mm-hmm. or your uh, chocolate hole. Yeah. And gravity would slowly force you lower and lower, forcing it up through you. Oh, my God. So it was a very slow, very painful way to die. It sounds like it. Oh, my gosh. 
Um, it was during this reign that Vlad first led an army through the Bran Pass into Transylvania to pillage Brashov as they harbored Vladislav II's son, Dan the Younger. Mm-hmm. He did make a treaty with the city that if they expelled, expelled Dan and made fair trade deals with the Wallachians, he would leave. Dan the Younger is actually the main source of the stories of Vlad's ruthlessness and bloodthirsty nature and his methods of killing, mostly citing his atrocities against the German Saxons of Brashov, where which he passed on to Germany, where the printing press had just been invented. So that's why we know so much about Vlad mm-hmm. Blackula. Is because basically because he did some he did some really atrocious things to some Germans. Mm-hmm. And the Germans had just invented the printing press. It was really easy to get the story out there. Right. right. So it's really the first, like, widespread media smear campaign. Ooh, I'm here for that. Love a good smear campaign. You just like smear. Like on toast? Yeah, let's go with that. Um, Wait, isn't that what they do? Put the smear on the toast? Or the bagels? I've only heard, like, Jewish comedians be like, you gotta put your schmear on your bagel. Oh, because it's like, that's just how they say it. I was making a sex and joke. Like, schmear is like uh, cream cheese and yeah. things. I was making a sex joke about schmear. Oh. Because you can like sh- schmear liquids. Oh, okay. Period. Anyways, um, Vlad would later execute Dan after a failed ev- invasion attempt in 1460. Mm-hmm. I can only assume that he impaled him. Well, he is Vlad the Impaler. You know something about impaling people, don't you, Paul? Boom, shh. Exact. I know more than a little something. Ooh. Um, how big is your steak? Moving on. <laughs> Sorry, I just didn't get the joke in there. No, it's fine. Um, in the early 1460s, Vlad Dracula broke relations with Sultan Mehmed II of the Ottoman Empire, refusing to pay him tribute in exchange for the Ottomans leaving the Wallachians alone. Mehmed sent an ambassador to Wallachia to command Vlad come to Constantinople to pay him homage and to basically agree to pay him tribute. Mm -hmm. During the meeting, Vlad demanded that the ambassador remove his headgear. So, like, at the time, you kind of wore, like, the Ottomans of a certain class would wear, like, these almost, like, turban-style cats. Mm Mm-hmm. And the ambassador refused, stating that it was part of his culture and his Muslim religion to keep it on. Vlad agreed and prompted his retinue to make sure that the ambassador did not lose his hat during his visit. Aw, nice. The sultan then received a package from Vlad containing the ambassador's head with his hat nailed into his skull. (laughs) I mean, he... Respected him and kept the hat on. So. <laughs> I love how that's what you get from the story. I mean, he killed him, but he kept his thing on. He respect respected his religion. Like I'm here for that. It was not respect. He was like saying, "Fuck you. You want to keep your hat on in my presence?" Oh, because at this time, um, with the European monarchs, you would remove your hat mm-hmm. when addressing them as a sign of respect. Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. And the fact that he wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, to add insult to injury, <laughs> Vlad then led an invasion into the Ottoman Empire in the name of the King of Hungary and the promotion of Christianity. Um, during this time, more stories of Vlad's ruthlessness and impaling spread, such as the forced of impaled bodies around Targoviste. So this was a civilian village in Ottoman-controlled territory, and Vlad basically killed every man, woman, and child, regardless of whether they were citizen or not, and impaled them. Jesus. That's ruthless. That's crazy. Um, yeah, and the Ottomans... So he did this well in retreat. So basically he attacked the Ottomans, and he couldn't... Like, he wanted to kill the Sultan. Mm-hmm. And the Sultan had already moved on, so he retreated. And during the retreat, he did that. And as the Ottomans were... Like, following him, Mm -hmm. they found that. Okay. And could you imagine, like, you're on offense. You're on offense. You're winning this war. And then you find a whole forest of impaled bodies. I'd turn around. That'd be it. We'd be like, okay, girl, we've seen enough. We've done enough. It's time to go home. And Vlad did 
beat the Ottomans, and he drove them all out of Wallachia except for one army, which was led by his brother Rudu, the one that who was mm-hmm. with him and held hostage with him. Rudu promised the Wallachian people safety from the Ottomans if they overthrew Vlad and made him voivode, which they did, and forced Vlad to flee into the Carpathian Mountains. Um, Vlad was then captured by the Hungarians and spent 14 years in prison until he formally converted to Christianity. Wait, what was he before? He wasn't really anything. Because mm-hmm. you have to remember, he spent like quite a few years being held hostage by the Ottomans. Mm-hmm. And it was like a princely thing. He was probably raised with the Sultan's children. I mean, I'm just going off what I could find on the internet. I did not do a whole deep dive into the life of Vlad the Third Vakula. Okay. He could have been Muslim. I think he was just like, whatever gets me my throne. Mm-hmm. I don't think he cared so much about religion because one minute he's leading a Muslim army to take his throne. And then the next minute he's fighting the Muslim Ottomans in the name of Christianity for the king of Hungary. Mm -hmm. So I think it's whoever could secure his place on the throne. It's all about power. As it was back in the day, literal Game of Thrones. It is literal Game of Thrones. Um, In 1475, the king of Hungary released Vlad, recognized him as the rightful voivode of Wallachia, and urged him to go and fight against Bazarab Leoda, who was the current voivode of Wallachia, who had submitted himself to the Ottomans. But the king of Hungary did not give him any military support to regain Wallachia. So he said, you're free, you're the rightful prince. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, So during this time, Wallachia settled at various times. So first he settled in Buda, Mm -hmm. which is in Hungary. And he actually had a house there called, which was called Dracula's house. I don't speak Hungarian. Cannot tell you how. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, and then he tried to settle in Brasov. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of the Wallachian noblemen lived in. So this was basically like if you were a Wallachian nobleman and the person that you supported for the throne got kicked out, you would go to Brasov. Mm-hmm. And so he tried to settle there. And basically this Bazarab was like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm going to kill you. So then Dracula went to Pest and he lived there. And while he was living in either Buda or Pest, which is now one city as Budapest, um, there's a story of a garrison of soldiers, like a group of soldiers, Mm -hmm. broke into his house chasing a thief who had broken into shelter there. Mm -hmm. And Dracula executed their commander for not asking his permission to enter the house. Dang, they're real serious about rules. So that's like... And customs. So that's like... Imagine... You live by a couple banks. Imagine somebody, like, b- robbed a bank, came here, broke into your house, and then the police came here and broke down the door to get the thief, and you killed the chief of police for not asking your permission to enter. Dang. So Vlad eventually did amass a small army, and he resorted back to his terroristic tactics, impaling enemies, burning civilian towns and villages down to the ground, killing women and children, and he fought the Ottomans and Brasarab's forces. Finally, in November 1476, Vlad launched an invasion into Velaki itself from Brasov and drove Bazarov out and was crowned voivode for the third time. In December, however, the Ottomans invaded Velaki again, and Late December or early January, Vlad was killed during battle against the Ottomans near Snegov. Tradition states he was executed on the banks of the Witch's Pond near Snegov. To this day, witches go to the pond to practice magic because it is said that Dracula, with his final words, cursed the pond. Okay, that's iconic. I'm here for that. It is said that no animals will ever drink the water of the pond. The water is said to have magical... Pr- powers and be used for spells and other magic and rumor has it that if a woman has an unwanted pregnancy and she goes and swims in the pond the pregnancy will reverse itself abortion pond that's crazy 
I want to see the abortion pond. Let's not call it an abortion pond. That's a very oh. triggering word, Paul. Well, what else would we call the pond? DJ? The witch's pond. It's proper name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Despite the many myths and stories, Vlad Dracula had some connection with Bran Castle. This is false. He had little reason to come to the castle as it was not within his realm, and it was actually in a territory that was pretty hostile to him. You look so pissed. Girl, we spent 45 minutes talking about this fucking castle, and he isn't even in the goddamn castle. However, Vlad passed the castle many times on his way to Brasov, which he had burned to the ground many times, uh, most of the time for them raising the taxes. Mm-hmm. And it's very likely that when he was captured by the Hungarians, he was held prisoner at the castle for two months before being moved to Budapest. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. So why is this castle that Vlad Dracula never inhabited called Dracula's Castle? Yeah. What's going on? Tell me. I need to know. What's going on? It started in 1897 when an Irish writer named Bram Stoker... Bram with an M as in Mary, not Bran as in Raisin Bran. Right. Um, published a novel called Dracula. The novel follows the attempt of an ancient Transylvanian vampire, Count Dracula, as he attempts to move to London for new hunting grounds. You know the story. Yeah, yeah. Despite later American adaptions, Count Dracula is not definitively Vlad Dracula. Bram Stoker was certainly inspired by the atrocities of Vlad Dracula to use the name for his own villain. Sorry, I'm taking it all in. You keep going. Sometimes you say things and I'm just shook and I need, like, some time to take all the information in. Um, So Stoker actually gave varying accounts in the novel. In chapter 18 of the novel, the titular Dracula is identified as that voivode Dracula. Whereas chapter 25 states he is another of the Dracula race living in a later age. So the book isn't very clear. Mm -hmm. Um, It was only after the novel was published and movies were released that people began to identify Bran Castle as the castle Dracula from the novel. Because it is the only castle in Transylvania which matches Stoker's descriptions. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. I got you. I it got is you. believed that Stoker was inspired by a drawing of the castle in Charles Boner's Transylvania, its people and its products, published in 1865. Don't make a Boner joke. Oh, uh, don't worry. I was distracted. So that is Vlad Dracula. Oh, yeah. That's the painting we see every time. I don't mm-hmm. like his mustache. I'm sure that mustache was all the rage for 1450. Must have been. (laughs) Um, And then this is what the original cover of Dracula looked like. Okay. And that's Bram Stoker. Mm -hmm. And that is Count Dracula as we know him, as portrayed by Bella Lugosi. Stoker, I barely know her. And then this is the drawing from Charles Boner's book that probably inspired Bram Stoker. Okay, yes. And it really accentuates the cliff. Mm -hmm. and everything very that very that and it is for that reason that brain castle is known outside of romania as castle dracula and the reason why bram stoker chose so the reason why it is thought that count dracula is not vlad dracula is that vlad dracula was valachian count dracula is transylvanian two different regions right and the reason why Stoker did this was Transylvania has a much cooler ring than Wallachia. It does. I will. I'm not going to lie. Also, Wallachia is fairly flat, mm-hmm. whereas Transylvania is like right in the middle of the Carpathian Mountains, so it's very mountainous, mm-hmm. which is a lot more dramatic. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so it's probably that. And Stoker never went to Romania. So he's relying on books, so he probably was like, hmm, there's this guy named Dracula. That's a good name. It is a good name. And actually, um, Dracul is modern Romanian for the devil. Oh, okay. So Dracula would be Romanian for son of the devil. Hmm. 
There you go, kids. So I showed you pictures of Castle Dracula, and Stoker, <laughs> Stoker described it as a vast crumbling ruin. Um, Jonathan Harker actually describes Castle Dracula as, quote, a vast ruined castle from whose tall black windows came no ray of light and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the sky. But being that Stoker was Irish, there are many of Irish castles that are ruins, and he also visited Scotland a lot. There are lots of Scottish castles mm -hmm. that bear resemblance. Um, and actually, if anything, in Wallachia... There is a place called Polinari Citadel, which was the actual home of Vlad Dracula, which also bears a lot of resemblance to the Castle Dracula of the book. And I'm going to show you a picture. Oh, that's nice. I like how it's up in the mountains and stuff. And snow. It's pretty. I like it. Big ruined castle high up in the mountains. And um, Bram Stoker never knew it existed. That's crazy. Even so, since becoming a tourist attraction, Bran Castle leans heavily into the Dracula story and openly markets itself as Dracula's castle. Oh, I would too. Get your money, sis. Um, yeah, they have several exhibits. So the museum is officially dedicated to Queen Marie of Romania as it was her last home. Um, and the family has tried to like recover furniture and artworks that Queen Marie had collected in her life and housed them there. Right. Uh, but has several exhibits to Vlad Dracula, who is, I mean, we like think like, oh my God, what a horrible man. He's a Romanian hero. Kind of like, I'm trying to think, like Ulysses S. Grant. Like this great general who saved the country. Right. That's kind of how they think of Vlad Dracula. Wow. You really know a lot about history. Thanks. See, when I think American hero, I definitely would not have said a Lucius S. Grant, and I cannot name one thing he did. He helped win the Civil War. Oh. Period. I mean, I I heard one, so part of my research was I watched Sam and Colby's investigation at Brand Castle. They did a... Yes, we can watch it. We oh can watch my. it. I mean, it's pretty good. Okay. Maybe I'll have to give that a good old view. Watch it because it really gives you a sense of the atmosphere of the castle. Mm -hmm. But at one point they were like, kind of like George Washington, but not like George Washington because he wasn't like the king of Romania and he didn't like found Romania. So like I was trying to think of like a, a fit, Eisenhower. He's like oh, Eisenhower. Yeah, the president. Yeah. But like before he became president, like just as a general. Oh, he was a general. That's cool. I don't know shit about history. I'm not going to lie to you. And one thing about me, I don't know shit about history. I don't know shit about the... Pre well, I know the presidents. I know enough. Like, honestly, I mean, I'm talking down on myself. But, like, when you were talking about the Axis powers and the four big people or whatever, like, I knew some of that. Like, I know some of it from I know, history and class. I try to take it down. And this is why I don't tell you anything beforehand. It's just... Be so you can't do research. And if I say something that's unclear, you can call me on it. Right. And trust and believe, I'll have questions, because Lord knows. <laughs> well, questions are good, and do you know what else is good? What? Hauntings. Ooh. Yes, I love a good haunting. So, Brain Castle is listed among the ten most haunted castles in the world. Yes! So, one of the first spirits that I want to talk about is the Strigoi. Strigoi. It sounds like a cryptid or like a demon. <laughs> No, they are restless souls who rise from their graves to torment the living and to suck blood from them to regain their strength. Huh. Kind of like a vampire. Kind of like a vampire. So, um, and this is very prevalent, especially around the Bran area. Mm -hmm. um, in the Bran area, they have their own variation, the Steragoi. Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying that right. And that can be a person who lives a normal, like, has a normal life during the day, but at night when they go to sleep, their spirit, do, like, does the same thing. Okay. So, and I mean, this is a Romanian belief, so this, so probably a lot of this was what inspired Bram Stoker in his description of vampires. And I actually, just this week, I read Dracula was when I was in high school. I, while we're, because I have to listen to something while at work, and I 
if I can't find a podcast, I do an audiobook. And this week's audiobook was Dracula by Bram Stoker. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course. I did not do it for research. I did this because I read the book again. <laughs> oh. I want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. I'm not that dedicated that I would read a Victorian Gothic romance novel again for research. So they hunt their prey from midnight until the cock's first crow. That's a rooster cock. Oh, damn. In the morning. I, I said it, but I was like, oh, shit. I thought they were talking about that Sean Cody about the Helix Studios. The you, you cocky thought, boys. You thought you were talking about, like, the discharge from a wet dream. <laughs> oh, no. Jeez. Okay, I don't want to get too into wet dreams, but, like, I never evil. really had one. Okay. Um, well, they can also transfigure themselves into various animals or make themselves invisible. Mm. Um, the only way to kill a Strigoi is to dig up their grave, cut out their heart, burn it, take the ashes, mix them with holy water, and to drink it, and then you stake the Strigoi's body into the casket. That's such a process. Jeez. But do you know what it sounds like? How you kill a vampire. Exactly. And you probably think, like, this is silly superstition. Romanian villagers have dug up corpses and staked them through the heart, believing them to be straight. Goy, as recently reported as 2004. Oh, gee. At which point the Romanian government said, please stop digging up the dead. (laughs) It's unsanitary. (laughs) They said, guys, come on. It's 20. It's 2004. We got to (laughs) stop. Come on, y'all. So, um. (laughs) <laughs> so my one grandfather, his um, the headmaster of his school was a priest, and he was a he was held in a Japanese prisoner of war camp mm-hmm. because like pre World War Two Japan was like staunchly anti Christian, mm-hmm. like they had their religion that was that it's like the government was yeah and so he was interred and then he was interred all throughout the war and he didn't get out until the americans liberated them in 1945 and he had been imprisoned with them so long that my grandfather said he actually developed a japanese accent oh and my grandfather used to tell stories and he was only like five foot two Mm -hmm. but my grandfather go but he was the strongest son of a bitch i ever did meet Wait, who was five? I thought you meant said your grandfather was five foot two. No, my grandfather was like five eight, five seven. The headmaster was like five two. Oh, the headmaster. Yeah. Wait. Okay. This is my favorite story, and it was so they had two way intercoms because this is like the late forties, mm-hmm. and the headmaster got on the thing, and he was like. Which one of you rabble rousers threw the third floor men's room trash can out the window on fire? And everyone started to laugh just because the story like threw the trash can out the window on fire. The story just kept getting bigger with every statement. Right, right. And they all laughed and the laughter slowly died down in the whole school. And then there was awkward silence, and then Master went, You wouldn't be laughing if I were there. This was back when you could beat children. Oh, yeah. And so I maybe. feel that's what the Romanian government is saying to these people who are digging up the Strogoi. Okay, 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 I get it. I know, I forgot why I told that story, too, and right. I had to look back at my dish to be like, like, why'd that come up? I thought we were talking about Japan. I thought we were talking about your grandpa in Japan or something. Like, No, my grandfather was never a prisoner of war. Oh, so who was? Why were you the talking? headmaster of his school. Oh, okay, it all makes sense now. All right. And he was 5'2", but like he did hard labor, so he was super strong. Oh, okay. Everything makes sense. Now. Yeah, brother Schick, rest in peace. Period. Yeah, one time. No, we gotta get off this yes. because this is totally. Unreal. We gotta get back I'll to tell Dracula. You later. Um. Yeah. So as recently as 2004, and I think I'm thinking they still do it. They probably do. Honestly. They just don't advertise it. Right. I mean, this last one was a little much though because a guy died. And then his brother died. And then his daughter died. 
and his other daughter, like all within quick succession, all very suddenly. And the surviving daughter, and like she was like old, like they were older and like she was middle aged. She had a dream that her uncle came to her in a dream and was tormenting her. She's like, it's a Strigoi, it's a Strigoi. So like the village literally went to the cemetery, dug all three of them up and like started to like do this. Mm-hmm. And I think like it was so big. That's why like the Romanian government was like, stop. <laughs> but I'm be- sure like now it's like, hmm. Uncle Rich came to me in a dream last night. It was not a good dream. Got a time to stick it through the heart. Right, gotta dig that bitch up. See, last night I had a dream about my father's mother, the one who you said like rest in peace, but she's still alive. Mm-hmm. And it was not a pleasant dream. Ooh. And I like woke up. I like woke up. So like I had a dream that I had a fight with her, and then I had a fight with my father, and I woke up, and I was really mad at my dad when I woke up. And then I, like, talk myself down and I was like, it's just a dream. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, so I wonder if my grandmother is a strugoi. But, like, the kind that, like... Does that while they're alive? Yeah. Do I have to stake my grandmother to the heart? I mean, Disclaimer, I'm not going to go into my grandmother's retirement home and stake her through the heart. Calm down, everyone. I just may be sending her garlic flowers. You know, do what you gotta do. That is not a ghost that's particular... It's... To the area, I'm not saying that there's a particular Strigoi who inhabits Brand Castle. It's just a really good one. Sam and Cooley, during their investigation, they did the Estes method, mm-hmm. which is where you take, for those of you who don't know, you take a spirit box, which rapidly goes through radio channels. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that a spirit can manipulate and pull out certain words. And so what you do is you wear noise-canceling headphones, which has them going on at a loud volume, and it just sounds like... And every so often a word will come through and you're blindfolded and somebody else will ask questions and you become a medium. So if we're doing it and I was blindfolded, Paul could be say, is anyone here? I'm blindfolded. I can't hear him. So I can't hear him. I can't see him. And I might hear Dave. Mm -hmm. Watch a video. It will make more sense than me explaining it. Right, right. It's a really cool method. So they did it, and they think that they got into contact with a Strogoi in the castle. Really? Yes. That's so cool. We can watch it after this, because it's very good. Mm -hmm. One ghost that is seen around the castle is Queen Marie. Um, She's often seen walking in her English garden or walking around the many balconies and verandas, which are along the modern parapets. Okay, that sounds like kind of peaceful. Could you imagine just being a ghost? Like, just... she loved it. She right. loved it so much. And, like, it's so nice that her heart got buried here. Um, and just, like, her She's... body's, like, buried with the rest of the Romanian royal family. But, like, her heart's there because, like, her heart was, like, this is where her heart was. Mm-hmm. And many people say that despite the long military history, they can feel Marie's feminine energy remain throughout the castle. Okay. I... So, like, they go through it and they go, like, Really? This was, like, a military fortress? Like, they have, like, rooms that are, like, dedicated to, like, the soldiers, and they have, like, it's called the torture chamber, and they have, like, a history of, like, torture devices and exhibition in there. Yeah, yeah. So, like, obviously you go in there and you're just like, oh. Mm-hmm. But, like, in other rooms, you're like, oh, like, it's so feminine in here. Right. Um, there are tunnels beneath the castle. Um, they're inhabited by an evil presence which stalks visitors and will throw stones at them. <laughs> Iconic. People also hear things whispered at them in Romanian. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have also reported seeing green glowing mists or shadow people. They've also reported hearing Romanian voices and shadow people in the castle chapel. That's so cool. So, Paul, are you ready to hear the worst haunting of Brand Castle? Oh, yeah. Lay it on me. American tourists. <laughs> Honestly, you know, that's a mood. Because we do ruin a lot of shit. Brain Castle is a tourist attraction and many people flock to it. Actually, last year, they had over 1 million visitors. In 2023 alone. Oh my gosh. And, like, it's very important. Like, the area of Brain, like, they thrive off the tourist community. Mm -hmm. They have the castle and then they also have Brain Village, which is a bunch of traditional Romanian it's a Romanian traditional village built at the foot of the castle. Yeah. That's like a theme park. You go and you see how like 
Romanian peasants lived in the old days. I mean, it's their economy, you know? Yeah, like, like that's how the town survives. Right. As an American who loves to travel and who loves to travel to foreign countries, I can confidently say I hate American travelers. Yeah, I'm probably one of those American travelers you hate, honestly. We're rude. We're close-minded. Okay, that's not me. I am not rude or close-minded. When I was in Paris, like, and I'm at the Louvre, and then there's, like, the American people. Where's the Mona Lisa? Dog, where's the Mona Lisa? Or you're in a restaurant. What's this? This doesn't look like the steak I get in America. <laughs> oh my gosh. Or my favorite. My favorite. So, like, the French smoke. Yeah. And, like, one of the great Parisian pastimes is to sit at a sidewalk cafe and have a cup of coffee or tea. And oftentimes, a French person will sit next to you and, like, be smoking. Mm hmm. And this American woman from a few seats, so I'm sitting right next to the French guy, mm -hmm. and he's smoking, and like I'm getting it right in the face, but I'm like, you know what, live and let live. Right. And I'm in high school at this time. Mm -hmm. And this American woman who is like, I'm like near one corner, she's at the other corner of this like restaurant, like along the sidewalk, and she gets up and she walks a distance of like ten feet to where this guy's sitting. She goes. Excuse me, sir, can you please not smoke? It's very unhealthy, and I have emphasis. Ah. Girl, embarrassing. Messy. And, and, like, the French guy literally looked at me like, what am I supposed to do? Oh, my God. You just tell her to fuck off. And, okay. So, many of the reviews from American visitors slam the castle for the following. The admission fees. You pay one admission fee to get in the castle. However, there are um, several other exhibits and attractions within the castle that cost extra. Oh, that would piss me off. I'm not gonna lie about it. I'm not. If I'm paying to get in your castle, it better be the whole fucking castle. But I mean, it's. I mean, I maybe it's just because I've been pl to plenty of museums where it's like you get into the whole castle, but there's this exhibition which costs extra. Okay, maybe I could see. Like, if it was a special thing. And it is. But... It's like... I mean, it's not like... Here's the whole castle, but to go in that room, it costs extra. And to go into that room, it costs extra. It's like, you get to tour the castle, but for this experience, you have to pay... Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Okay, that makes so it's more not sense. Like you, it's not like you pay one fee, and then you have to pay a fee for every room you go into. Okay. There's general admission, and then there are other exhibitions. And you have to remember that this is a private museum and gets no government supplemental income. Mm -hmm. It is not run by the Romanian Ministry of Culture. It is run by the Archduke Dominic von Habsburg of Austria, who is 86 and who is trying to run this from his home in New York. They also slam the lack of ghosts. Okay, same though. <laughs> I, I will admit, um, I will. this is the point where I admit, yes, I went very heavy on the history. That's because after choosing this topic and doing all the research, did I find out that there are very few reported hauntings. Right, right. But you know, Vlad the Impaler is haunted enough. But anyways, there are some ghosts, but I will say that as an Olympic American... I don't want to see you, so why would a dead Romanian? I mean, that's if, true. If you were walking around this castle... Jeffrey? Jeffrey? Do you think, like, Queen Mary slept here? She did? This doesn't look very queenly. We have a king-sized bed at home. It looks more homey. A queenly bed at Yes, it's true. They say one woman's house is another woman's stretch heap. There you, I mean... Why on earth would a ghost come out with some <laughs> with someone doing that? And I mean, I, the inaccess ability. Oh, are they not ADA compatible? <laughs> Excuse the fuck out of me. So... <laughs> Damn, Vlad the Impaler didn't make his castle wait, ADA accessible. Wait, no. Even funnier than that. Um, several reviews state that it's ridiculous that the castle was not built with the American physique in mind. Oh, honey. Namely that there are no escalators and there is only one elevator in the building. Sister, honey, girl. 
Um, mostly they're talking about there's a secret passageway that leads from the second to the third and fourth floors. It was not discovered until the early 2000s. So, like, it's original the castle. Was not known about until the early 2000s, at which point it became, like, part of the tourist thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's super narrow. It's super steep, like, almost like a ladder steep. Mm-hmm. And I can say, when I was in Ireland and I went to a medieval castle, there was this woman who was behind me. And it's, it's a medieval castle probably built around the same time. And it was this really narrow spiral staircase. And she gets to the top and she's berating, like, the woman who's there from the museum. She's like, what do you mean I gotta fucking do it? I'm like, look at me. You expect me to walk upstairs? Right? Like, what do you expect? It's a freaking medieval castle. Like- and the woman just looks at her and she goes, ma'am, did you not read the disclaimer before you signed up for this? It states very clearly, we have one elevator, and it is only accessible at the end of the tour. This is my favorite one. Dense. So, American tourists come to it because it is Dracula's castle, but there's too much Dracula there. (laughs) What? That's why you went there. Um, In addition to several exhibits about the real Vlad Dracula... The gift shops all have many Dracula-themed products appealing to the foreign concept as the castle is Dracula's castle. Oh yeah, no shit. So, to end, I have a final disclaimer for any of our American listeners who may want to visit Dracula's Brand Castle. This is a 12th century military fortress which was converted into a royal residence and is owned by a private family. There is a lot of walking, a lot of stairs, there are ramps, and only one elevator. It will not be easy to go through. But if McDonald's really means more to you than climbing a secret passage built in the 1300s, then it's your fault, not Brand Castles. I feel seen. Because I love McNuggets. I mean, I, it's just more... If you're going to complain about not being an exercisey person... And then go to some place that's all stairs. It's not their fault. Let's move on. Paul, smash or pass Queen Marie of Romania? Smash? She seems like a doll. Oh my gosh, she seems so nice and she did so much in her lifetime. Icon, queen, legend, the moment. And she was really pretty. We stan. Like, Queen Victoria was not a very pretty woman. Mm -hmm. But she's really pretty. Right. This is a Stan podcast. We stand Queen Marie on this podcast. So, sorry, Paul. I thought this was going to be a lot more haunted than it ended up being. You know, I, is, I've come to realize some episodes are just going to be history episodes, and that brings you joy, and I'm going to let you have that. Okay, I mean, it does bring me joy, but, like, honestly, I was hoping to, like, talk about ghosts, and, like, you're just going to have to make do with Vlad Tepish. You know, sometimes you have to make deal. But you know what? There is a Hungarian restaurant here in Pittsburgh, and they make a delicious chicken paprikash, mm-hmm. which is a very Eastern European dish. We have to go because it is delicious. I'm here for it. Let's do it. Yeah, sorry. Like, I definitely... <laughs> no one was more misled than I was going into this. You know, it happens to the best of us. Um, but I, I did make it a point to title this Brain Castle and the Real Dracula. So I did present you Brain Castle, which has a very rich storied history and is marketed as Dracula's Castle, as well as the real story of the Real Dracula. Period. And this episode is for all of our history buffs out there, all of our history lovers. And next week, I promise to have a really good ghost story. Fingers crossed. No, I'm kidding. I'm fucking with you. This was a good episode. um, I learned a lot. This was cool. I learned a lot. And you know, all I can say, (laughs) in the words of Count Dracula, (laughs) come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. I'm all for come for you. That's a real quote from the book. And I I looked it up because I was like, I want that to be part of the intro. I looked it up and the way I found it, 
was somebody turned it into a live, laugh, love sign. <laughs> where it was like, come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. And I was like, is nobody telling these poor live, laugh, love moms that this is from Dracula? <laughs> like, it's a beautiful saying, mm-hmm. but I just, I think for my grandmother's birthday, I'm going to get her beautiful, like, print. Like, come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Mm -hmm. So, like, she puts it out and be like, oh, like, this is going to make guests feel so welcome. It probably will, honestly. (laughs) But, like, it will just, like, bring me so much joy that that's a Dracula quote. It's pretty funny. And as you come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring, remember... The best way to ward against the Thoragoi is, is to, keep, to keep... follow us on all of our social <laughs> oh, media. Oh, to end the episode. Don't worry. I got us. We're g- Please follow us on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. And be sure that if you enjoy listening to us to tell your friends, family, and coworkers who are also interested in the topics we cover. Um, well, the best way to ward against vampires is to keep your crypts tight. And your corks loose. Bye! Bye. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs>